The following announcement has been paid for by the new Woo. He used to do this, remember? Woo! <laughs> it's the new Perfect. <clears throat> Do things a little differently this time around. Still up. Well, just as well because I'm going to read you a bedtime story. Let's get to chapter 13. <clears throat> it's a house of predator. So one afternoon, I got a phone call from Matt's father, Norman, about Matt being released from jail, and if I could house him, he would pay the rent. How much would I charge? I had a mixed feeling about this because I didn't know if I could deal with lowercase Matt living with me, but I knew the extra money would help, so I agreed for Matt moving in, but it was also a sacrifice because his address would be mine and it would be registered on the sex registry. So again, Knowing I had some noisy neighbors, how the word of that would get out. I made mention to Kevin about Matt, and he told me, do what you think is right. I asked Kevin he could live with him, and responded back by saying, hell no. Then again, it was a waste of time even communicating to him about any favors. And the only thing I could count on Kevin for was being my trusty co-host where he would be noticed on camera. So when Matt was released, I okayed it, and Matt moved in 2006. Fontaine was going, and I would take Fontaine to the church to do his business on the grass. While Fontaine and I were driving back to the house, Matt and his father were getting things settled in the guest room. I told them both that I was taking it on the chin, and neighbors can know of this, which would cost me issues. So knowing that I was sacrificing my reputation, ah, excuse me. So knowing that I was sacrificing my reputation, I said I need rent on a timely basis. Norman Matt's dad agreed to this and would pay me five hundred dollars for his son's rent until he got settled with work. That never seemed to happen because of Matt's rap. She took instant liking to Fontaine. Fontaine. Obviously, at first, was ready to buy the settle. So eventually, it worked itself out. Matt was at my place for little less than a month, and the neighbor across the street, who was an ex Norfolk cop, seemed to be perched out in front of his door one morning while I talked while I walked to my car. He was writing a piece of shit that would mumble under his breath and stared me down. He would do this even before Matt moved in. This one particular morning, he walked up to my driveway. The actual first time I ever had words with this guy. He said, can I have a moment with who? I said, yes. Go ahead. He said, do you know this guy? He was holding up a picture of Matt. I said, yes, that's my roommate. We just moved in about a month ago. How do you have this picture? He started by saying this picture was from the sexual register and that he is a criminal that was charged with aggravated assault. Are you aware of this? I said, yes, I'm aware of it, but what's to you? He served his time and paid for his crime. He's not bothering you, so you shouldn't be concerned with him. He then proceeded to say that there was an elementary school nearby, children that lived on the street, and he was going to make it his business. said, well, you need to mind your own business for your face. It's knocked off. He was a loudmouth son of bitch that drove a Ford 150. He would walk around with a gun, making him a big hot stuff. He thought he could interfere in my business, but the bitch is in for a rude awakening. He was a big fat red man. His next door neighbor on his side of the street was a loudmouth son of a bitch as well. They would always stand together in their driveways, staring at my house in the morning. A strange, deranged man that needed to mind his business. Matt, Matt was made 
well aware of it, and that was intimidated by it and worried the whole time he would be approached by this bitch. I simply told Matt he had nothing to fear from that old fuck. At the time, four cars. Had two Dooms, three series and five series. One Mercedes wagon I had bought in a Volvo wagon. It was bitches across the street, but always parked in the front of my house. So I would park the Volvo in the front with one of the beamers to block me from parking in front of my house. I'd come a recluse. Where he couldn't go out and do anything. He had to report weekly to patrol officer. I tried to help him as much as I could, but it was hard in dealing with some of his habits. And then, worrying about my property when I wasn't there with that crazy neighbor. Meanwhile, Nigel and I had planned to go to Vegas and had talked about it. He heard of the trips that I had made there and wanted to go taking his new girlfriend with us. So, this time I flew and told Matt to hold the fort down. Matt was concerned about being left alone, but I said, it'll be fine. Of course, I took Fontaine to the pet resort because I didn't fully trust Matt Fontaine for that long period of time not being there. Later, I received a call from the private investigator who informed me that Sue was married and living in the outskirts of Vegas in Quran. This time, I got in contact with LaDonna to inform her I was in town. LaDonna had asked me if I fully got Sue out of my system and told her maybe she could help me with my getting her totally out. She smiled and said, well, we will just see about that. It was the middle part of two, right, 2006, so I decided to take a tour of Los Angeles. I got a rental car, drove there, told Nigel to get a room at the Luxor, and I'll be in LA for a few days and we'll come back to Vegas at the end of the week. <clears throat> got out to Los Angeles. Some maniac was passing me from the right side of the street. Highway people were driving like maniacs, not really giving a damn about the other drivers. While well, I approached Hollywood, I saw a lot of homeless people. I saw a lady looking extremely rough, pushing a shopping cart with a baby doll in the cart. I said to myself, what the fuck? When I got to the motel, I saw everything it was paid parking. Trying to find a place where to park was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Walked up to the hotel inquiring about why it was all paid parking. If I was staying at the hotel, I shouldn't have to pay for parking on top of it. She said, welcome to Los Angeles, California Park. Everybody has to pay to park. That was just insane in my eyes. I wasn't impressed with Los Angeles. From the get-go, I had a bad taste of the mouth about the city. But it was totally a ripoff. Spent time in Hollywood and the Walk of Fame with all the stars, prints around the sidewalk. You're the Chinese man eater? Stood in line to be on the prices right. Went to two shows, but you could see me and the audience on the aisle seat when the contestants were called up on stage. I never got called up, but it was fun just the same to actually be on camera seeing Bob Barker on the iconic prices. Probably the only good experience I had going there. Stayed there four days and then took the rental and headed back to Vegas. So the plan this time was to get the Donna to lower out Sue, but first, after obtaining the address from the private investigator, Nigel and I took a trip up there. I was out in the desert. Crazy scenario, to say the least. So I knocked on the door, and there was no answer. Then I knocked again, and some muscle-bound man came to the door, and I asked for Sue. He said, what do you want with her? I'm a previous friend from out of town, I'm visiting. And he said, well, I'm her husband. You have no need to be here. I said, you are her husband. I said, out of no disrespect, I found that hard to believe. He said, leave. I said, not until I see Sue, because I don't believe for a second you are her husband. Then he became louder 
and said, Lee, I said go to hell, bitch. Just tell her I was here and I'll be back. And you motioned me back to the car. And I said, I'm not intimidated by that half breed punk. He drove back to Vegas from the run. Spoke to LaDonna and told her what happened and said, we need her help. She told George, this is the last time because I can do better than her. I said, I do believe that. Just then, the private investigator confirmed that, in fact, she is married to that bozo. So the last day I was there, LaDonna went there and visited Sue while Nigel and I waited in the car. After a minute or so, she came out with a baseball bat and wanted to bash my car in it, saying, where is he? LaDonna came to the back, uh, came back to the car and said, Sue didn't want to have nothing to do with it. She said, come on, why all three of us leave and get some drinks? Maybe you can so we can have good times, George. I said, LaDonna, I'm really freaking hurting, but I guess it's time we need that clean break. So LaDonna, Nigel and myself went back to Vegas and went to the liquor store to get poker at our house. Finally, LaDonna passed out and Nigel was rummaging through the refrigerator. I said, dig yourself, man. Nigel said, here's the opportunity for you, for you, to get close. You lose one to get another. Now LaDonna got up and said, come to my window. Then LaDonna said, come to my room. I said, okay. I felt slightly uncomfortable, not knowing where it was going to lead. LaDonna pulled my shirt off and said, Georgie, clear your mind and soul, and let me make you feel better. Then she rubbed my back and then proceeded to pull my pants off. She said, I'm going to baby you and fuck Sue. <laughs> I said, LaDonna, you are drunk, and I'm not going to take advantage of food. I said, though, I will sleep in your bed, cuddle with you. So that's what we did while she was grazing with her hands in my private area. Finally, a few hours later, while I went to the bathroom, Nigel was passed out on her couch. I said, dude, we're going to leave in a bit. I just can't take advantage of her. She's drunk like this. Then I went back to her room, and she rubbed her feet on my privates and her hands. I said, it's tempting, but I can't have sex with food. Joined the foreplay, and it looks like I'll be coming out here now for a different lady. We hung out a few hours longer than headed back to the hotel. Then Catherine, the it was mad inquiry when I'd be coming back home. I said, eh, probably a week. He said that man across the street made a paradigm. I said, don't worry about that, freak. That son of a bitch can't bother you. After spending another week, and listening to Nigel and his girl banter back and forth, we head back home. I got home on neutral ground and got Fonte from the resort. He was jumping up and down and took a massive crap on the floor of the entrance of the resort. I said, good boy, I taught you how to take a shit on site. Lol. Back home, Matt was pacing back and forth and seemed relieved to see me at the door. It seemed like the bitch. Across the street was up to no good concerning Matt. School bus was broken down on the street. Asshole who lived on the block drove a school bus, and I recognized it was that prick's bus. It seemed strange, but a few days later, Matt's probation officer had called the house and seemed to grow mad about him hanging around the school bus talking to the kids on it. I added two and two and told Matt it was a setup because that bus has driven up the street and was trying to peg Matt for being around kids. I knew it was a setup and told Matt he needed to go down for a restraining order against that bitch across the street. I got on the phone and explained to the probation officer that the neighbors were probably hoping to tag Matt with some phantom charge and park the bus closer to my house. I went off on the neighbors and told them, mind their own fucking business and stop plotting to fuck Matt. 
He's paid his dues, so leave him the fuck alone. Finally, a few months later, Norn and Matt's dad moved him out because feeling pressured about everything and kind of pissed me off. Just back to me and the pooch and the empty house. Meanwhile, I put an ad in the paper to add to the show. Kevin Vince and I shot more shows at the Caroline and had more shots of outdoor shots. Jim redacted, brought his camera, filmed our skits. Now we would miss Scream of 2006 and had our live show in the Black of Summer of 2006. So we had more shows and comical add-on from the character of Boris the Butler, played by Keith and Allen. He was a cartoonist and animation specialist that did the Care Bears. He ties to the world of animation and befriended Kevin. Meanwhile, we had an old hag that did indie films and supposedly responded to my ad in the paper. I had some reservations because she seemed a little abrupt and eccentric. Sarah redacted. You know who she is. But I know she would cause issues years later. There was a gathering at a fancy restaurant with her and I and Ryan and his new girlfriend of that. The episodes of the show, I was a minister that married them on camera. Brian was the same buffoon that was on my show when you met. Vet was a blonde that had some emotional issues, and Ryan and her would constantly be arguing. When a vet was near me, Ryan got jealous since he thinks I stole Lisa from me. So while we were having dinner, Ryan was drunk and started cussing out a vet. Sarah nudged me. Instead, if your friend doesn't stop, she is leaving. I told Ryan to put a sock in. Finally, he insulted Sarah, which at the time I went off on him, but felt later she needed to be told off. Mind you not, I was interested in Sarah's so-called context and entertainment. I was never attracted to her. Repeat never in bold text. Little tidbit of information, it was Halloween that year. She and I went to a costume party. The other that evening, she made some inappropriate comments, so I came back in many words and told her, let's go fuck yourself. So, ended that, and then she latched on to Kevin and tried to wedge our friendship. She appeared in one show, in which I never aired, because she actually brought it down. At the time, she was in her 60s and came back later. More to come, that bitch. To backtrack, I started doing Kung Fu in late 2005. <laughs> the Kung Fu instructor was a part-time employee at Dillard's department store. Kader Norza was a Kung Fu instructor. He recruited people to his class that came to Dillard's. He recruited me, and I started Kung Fu in June 2005. He worked with me in a stern but motivated way. I got as far as the blue belt and began to tear muscles in my legs. <laughs> I learned the different forms and the stands for grappling and shalom, shalom, fighting techniques, fighting technique. Sorry. I learned the different forms and the stands for grappling, shalom, fighting technique, takedown technique. I also knew the different holds of takedowns, also the submission holds. It was a great to kick in the air. I had a great instructor with me and got me faster with faster agility. I enjoyed it. And he told me to always stretch. Always stretching before workouts was drilled in our heads by Cotter. He worked with me until late 2006. I could have stayed in, but I tearing up my muscles. Stop. In later, in the year of 2006, Cotter also appeared on one of my shows talking about his art of Kung Fu and how long he practiced before he started training others. We did some other shows live from the station during the holidays. Lisa came back in the picture in October of 2006. She and I came cozy and apologized to one another. So comes the new year. And I put this in a separate video. I'll, uh, I'll add the pages. 
at the actual pages from the book. Purdue.